All right, we are looking at Revelation chapter 12, part two. That's part two for you who don't speak French. I don't speak French. Tanda does, so, but I don't. Tanda speaks fluent Spanish, French. Oh, yeah, whatever she said. So, I think she said I was thin. That's what I heard. Okay. Uh, um, so, Revelation chapter two, re- chapter 12, part two. Uh, just to kind of, in order to kind of continue the, the thought from last week, because I think you, if you don't, to kind of start chapter 12 without talking about last week, it kind of thrusts you in the middle of something that you don't know what's going on. Turn it up. Uh, so last week we talked about this um, heavenly history lesson, for lack of a better term, that God is kind of taking, uh, you know, we have all these things happen. We had the last, the, all the, all the uh, we had the trumpet judgments finish up. And then all of a sudden, we kind of take a heavenly break to get a different perspective about the end times. And so uh, chapter 12, 13, 14, 15 are all kind of a heavenly perspective of what's going on in the end times, okay? Uh, perspective is a powerful thing. I mean, we see things our way, and sometimes um, when, when life is happening to us, we ask God, why is it happening this way? I don't understand why this is happening to me. I don't understand why this is happening to this family. I don't understand. And we think, see things from our perspective, and, and sometimes uh, we need to see things from God's perspective. You know, the scripture says, the Lord said, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So sometimes um, if you're going through things you can't explain or you don't understand, you're just, just remember you're looking at it from your perspective, not from God's perspective. And so my experience is that God's always up to something greater than my perspective can see. So if that kind of gives you some hope, sometimes you're going through some things, God's perspective, God's, what God's doing is bigger than your perspective. So this is kind of an insight. It's kind of cool to see a historical insight into what God's doing. So we looked at chapter 12. There are three main characters we looked at. The first was uh, the, the, we had the woman who represents Israel. Uh, we had the the great red dragon that represents Puff. No, just kidding. No, not that guy. It represents Satan. And we know it's Satan because the scripture tells us who it is. Okay. Uh, and then we had the, the male child that was born from the woman. You know, Jesus came from the nation of Israel. And so the male child came from the woman. And right away, the dragon was there to try to kill the child when it was born. And we know that from uh, Matthew chapter 2, when Jesus was born, the wise men came, and uh, right after they left a different way, Herod the king came in, and he killed every child in Bethlehem under the age of two. So the dragon, right away, Satan has always wanted to cut Jesus off. He's always wanted to stop the work of God. And um, he still wants to do that in your life today, by the way, too. It hasn't stopped. Satan's trying to, trying to cut off the work of God in your life. And, and even in the passage we're looking at today, you'll see that. You'll see Satan is still actively trying. If, if, if Satan can't stop your heart uh, from following God, he wants to stop your heart from beating. You know, I mean, that's just the way it is. He's just, if he can cut you off, uh, he'll, he'll take off a toe if that's what it does. He'll take you off at the knees if that's what it does. He'll take you out as much as he's capable of. Um, because that's what his purpose is. He doesn't, he still, he, his purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy, it says in John chapter 10. So, so if Satan tried to do that, and the scripture says that didn't work, and then all of a sudden we see this male heir was taken up into heaven. Something interesting, I, I always think that that's still Jesus, because Jesus was born, taken up to heaven. We know that happened in Acts chapter, Acts chapter uh, 1, where Jesus was taken up into heaven, and people watched it happen. Uh, I was reading something even just to, uh, yesterday that some people were saying, well, that, that was, that's the church getting raptured. And I'm like, okay, I thought it was interesting, but I don't agree with it, but I thought it was interesting that, that they would say that because the male child is Jesus, and I don't understand how Jesus is, all of a sudden changes to the church. I just didn't understand that. But anyway, so uh, Jesus is taken up to heaven, and then what happens next is there's a period of time, because by the way, this story happens that we're looking at happens rather quickly. So for you to say, well, how can you pastor say there's a period of time where the woman basically goes off into hiding for, what is it, 1,280 days? How can you say there's a great period of time before that happens? Well, because we started the whole story at the book edge of the book of Genesis, then all of a sudden we got to Jesus, and now we're at the end. So the story does move along pretty quickly. You don't spend a lot of time. It's like creation, Jesus, the end times. And isn't that, I think that, by the way, that's the focus of Scripture. 
everything in Scripture relates to creation, Jesus, or the end. That's why I think people are so curious about Revelation, because they know it's all wrapped up in the end. So, um, so the, the, uh, the woman is taken away, she's hidden, and that brings us to, let's see here. We're going to start with verse, oh, uh, there's a great war in heaven. Satan is thrown out of heaven. He's cast out of heaven is, is the last thing that happens. And uh, we talked about how Satan has access to heaven, just like he did in the book of Job, that the angels, the sons of men, uh, I'm sorry, the sons of God could appear before the presence of God at different intervals and Satan would be there with them. And what was Satan's purpose in appearing with them? What was his purpose? When Satan was up there with the angels, what was he doing? He was accusing, yeah. His whole purpose, like in the book of Job, he's saying, Lord, you know, he's saying, God, if you'll, if you'll hurt Job, he won't follow you. If you'll, if you'll touch everything but his life, he won't, he won't follow you. You know, you have this idea that Satan's job, he's, called, he's the one who accuses the brethren both day and night. That's just what Satan does. He, and, and by the way, I don't think he just has that voice toward God. I think Satan has that voice inside of us sometimes. We're talking about how you're not good enough and how you're not serving God like you should and how you are deficient and how you should just give up. That's, that, that to me, that same spirit is what, what he tries to drive into each one of us to doubt our relationship with God, to doubt who we are as believers, to doubt who we are as children of the living God. Satan wants to convince you that you're not God's, that, you're not, you, that you don't belong to him. God's with an apostrophe S, okay, not little g. g that's, a, that's a different thing that some other people believe that we don't. But I'm talking that you are, you belong to God. You're his children. Satan wants to convince you that you don't. So, uh, so as God's, God casts Satan out of heaven, and we believe that's going to happen the last three years of the Great Tribulation, Satan will no longer have access to God. So all that anger, resentment, and idea that his time is limited, he's going to take it out on the world. That's why the last part of the Tribulation is so terrible and so devastating. Because Satan has nothing to do but just pour out his wrath upon humanity to get everyone he can, because he knows. You ever, you ever seen those, uh, those shows like the guys' grocery games, where they have at the end, they always have this few minutes where they have to go around and grab as much stuff as they can? You know what? That, that's what Satan's trying to do in the last three and a half years. He's trying to get every person that he can before his time runs up, because he knows it's not going to be very long. Satan, by the way, Satan is not omniscient. Satan doesn't know everything. So, so Satan, Satan's not out there going, I know how this is all going to wrap up. Matter of fact, the other scripture says, had he known about Jesus, he, would have, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory, had he known. So Satan doesn't know everything. He's not, he's not, sometimes he's blinded by his own rage and by his own anger and by his own evil. He can't see everything. But I do think, I think he's been in enough prophecy classes, he's probably got this much figured out, that when he's done, he's got to get, he's going to let everybody have it. So, and that brings us to today. How long did that take? Yeah, it took a little while. Verse 10 through 12 is the response of heaven at Satan being cast out for the last time. Satan no longer has access to heaven. He no longer has the ability to come into... And by the way, I was, we were talking this... this not that this, to tie this in. We were talking about free will in our chapel service day with our, with our older students. And I said, if you think about free will and God, isn't it interesting that God would give Satan the opportunity to stand before and accuse the brethren. Why wouldn't God just not let him do that? I mean, I wouldn't give, the Bible even tells us, don't give place to the devil, right? Don't do that. Well, here he is, he has access, and like, why would God do that? Why would God do that? Sometimes I don't understand why God does that. I think a lot of it has to do with his idea. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's just about to show us God's great love for us. I don't know if it's, some people have, here's, here's an interesting thought I had about that. What if God gives Satan the opportunity to come and accuse us before his presence so that he's not down here messing with us during that same time. So actually, by him being there, God's showing grace to us because God's not affected by the words that Satan's... That, I don't know if that's... A, never read that anywhere. Just, that just, I just got thinking about it and I thought, what if that's really an expression of God's grace, not for, the, not for the enemy, but really for us? What if that's just God's grace for us? Just, just a thought. I mean, if it is, you know, think about all the garbage. How much garbage would you put up with for the sake of somebody else? You know, we like to just say, no, no more garbage, get out of here, you know. 
I don't need your loser attitude. But God does that for us. Just, just a, I'm not saying that's why. I'm just saying it was just a thought I had. So this is the response of heaven, verses 12, uh, 10 through 12. Does someone want to read that? Revelation 12, verses 10 through 12. Thank you, Linda. Mm. Okay, so verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven say, so who do you think, who would you ascribe that voice to? Is it Jesus? Is it an angel? Is it a saint? Is it a poor living creature? Any idea? I, I, anybody got a... Yeah. Because it says, for the accuser of the brethren who accuses them, it says, um, our, and it's like, like it's somebody like an angel or, or the church. Yeah. Or somebody said, because it's our place. Right. It, it, our brothers and sisters is our what it says. So it must be not an angel. I don't think an angel, we call him brother angel, but I think it's actually a saint. This is someone who is, I don't know whether it's an apostle, I don't know whether it's a. But it's, I, think it's, I think it's someone who's, you know, because there are, by the way, in, in, in heaven, and we talked about this in Revelation chapter 5, you had not only the four living creatures, but you had the 24 elders. And, and is that 24 or 12 elders? 24? 24 elders. And the 24 elders are people. So in, in probably it'd be one of those people that's saying this. Because it's actually... Um, uh, in Hebrews, it says, it talks about um, being surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses. It talks about that in Hebrews chapter 12. And it talks about this idea of people watching us and cheering us on. Let us run the race that's set before us, uh, not being hindered by the sin that so easily entangles us. Um, you get this idea that people are actually watching us and cheering us on from heaven. I think, I think it's one of those voices that we're hearing here. It's that... So if you ever feel alone, if you ever feel like no one's cheering you on, heaven is cheering you on to keep doing what God's called you to do. Uh, I think it's uh, kind of interesting. It's like, finally, the guy's gone. He's out. Yeah, right. Finally, he, Satan's he, gone. He got rid of him. He's gone. You know, uh, why do you put up with him in this world? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's oh, yeah. Like, Yeah, for, think about heaven. I mean, even if we understand God was showing us grace in that moment, heaven would be sick of it. I mean, there's, <laughs> we're like, why is this loser allowed to come up here and do this? And so now the joy of heaven of not having that voice anymore. I mean, man, think about that. Think about if you and your life were never affected by, by that voice in your life, how much it would change and transform you if, that, if his voice never was in, impacted your life again. I mean, how exciting would that be for us? No more negativity, no more putting you down, no more tempting you to sin, none of that stuff. All that stuff's gone. So love that voice gone. Get that voice out of here. Uh, why is Satan called the accuser of the brethren? Why is he called the accuser of the brethren? Why is that his hobby? Yeah, that's right. That's what he was doing. Why is why does Satan have that hobby? What's 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 hit, what's in it for him to accuse people? What's what's his what's that motivation? I think it's, it's twofold. I think it's to try to tear us down, put us up there, so you know, like he did Job, and God allowed him to do so much, but he knew what Job could take. But he wants Satan to understand that. There's a salvation there that he can't have. Hmm. That there's nothing he can do to cut them off unless they cut themselves off. Right. So, uh, and you know, it says something about the and the kingdom of God and the authority of His Messiah. Right. 
because the Messiah is what bought, brought our salvation. And that's our salvation is secure because of the Messiah. Right. So he's, I always have to repeat it for the people at home that are watching. So there are, there are, um, so just as in Job's case, where we have Job chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, where God was illustrating to Satan that there's things that, that the redemption of man, what God is doing in Job's life, he can't touch. He can't take away no matter how evil he is. There's just no way for him to do that. And that's awesome. Richard? Maybe if he tries to make us look bad, he'll make himself look good in God's eyes. Yeah. So he's also saying, Richard was saying, if it makes makes us look bad, it makes him makes Satan look good. Like, look how good I am, look how bad they are. I always think Satan wants to, if he knows God loves something, he wants to take away what God loves. He wants to destroy what God loves. Okay? What about that he's just trying to rub it in his face that we're sinful. We are all sinning. And he was there in the garden and helped introduce sin into the world. So he's like, well, if I can do it there, I can do it to all. Sure, sure. So just 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 rubbing it into God, saying if I if you if I did it in the garden, I can do it again. And uh, yeah, that's, yeah, he's yeah, that's what he does. Zechariah three one is a prophecy that Zechariah had about the accusing of the brethren, and it says God then uh, the Lord showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Uh, in the in the book of Zechariah, you had. Uh, you have Joshua the leader, and you have Zerubbabel that are doing God's work. In the vision of the lampstands and the olive trees, both of them are the ones that God is using. And even in the midst of that, in, in, in Zechariah 3, Satan's right there accusing him. And I don't think he's just accusing him to God. I, I think Satan doesn't just accuse us before God. I think he accuses us to ourselves. I really do. I really think Satan wants you to feel you're not, you're not really worthy. Um, that you shouldn't follow God. I see a lot of a lot of believers that get really down and think I should just abandon my faith because because things in my life are so bad I just need to give up. And that's that's the core of what Satan wants people to do. He wants them to give up. He wants them to surrender. So don't do that. That's what the accuser wants you to do. It's not what Jesus wants you to do. Uh, verse eleven talks about the victory that's experienced by those who uh, who are in faith. How they overcame Satan. What two things did they use to overcome Satan? And they overcame him by blood of the Lamb and by? Okay, the word of the testimony. These are, if you want to know, if you're feeling accused, if you're feeling, if you're feeling set apart that, you, that you're not right with God or you're not good enough for God, I hear that a lot from people. Not that they're not right with God. I'm not good enough. I'm not doing enough. Uh, I don't know how, I mean, if you, how many kids you have. Okay, I have four children. And uh, my kids will never do enough to be my children because they are my children. You know what I mean? My, what do your kids have to do to become your children? I mean, what do they have to do? What do they have to perform? What act do they have to? I mean, they have to juggle knives or chainsaws. No, you can't juggle chainsaws. You're not my son, you know. That's not the way it is, right? I mean, your kids are your kids because you love because of who they are, not because of what they do. And we are gods, not because of what we do, but because of whose we are. That's why we're God's children. Satan wants you to believe that you are a trained monkey that is not doing enough to, to help the organ grinder do what he's supposed to do. So you're not out there doing enough. You're not working hard enough. And so and if you're not dancing enough, dance, monkey, dance. If you're not dancing enough, then God doesn't want anything to do with you. That's, what's, that's, that's, the, you know, that's a works mentality religion. That's, that's not a faith mentality. Faith says, by faith, I became a son and daughter of the living God. Amen. That's by faith. It's not by, it's not by works of righteousness that I have done, but according to his mercy that saves me. If I'm trying to equate what I do to my relationship with God, I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing. Now, does God want me to do good works? That's always the tension in Scripture. Yes. Yes, good works are part of who we are, but the good works don't save us and make us who we are. The good works are an evidence of who we are. You know, not, you know, like your last name is an evidence of your family. It's, it's not what you did. It's who you are. So, anyway. So, what, so thinking about this, the way you overcome that voice in your life is two things. Number one, the blood of the lamb. You have to understand what the blood of the lamb does in your life. When you accept Christ in your life, that the blood that Jesus shed on the cross has a tremendous power in your life. There's three things, and I only picked three things. I could have picked more, but it's only an hour study. And we're only, 
uh, go on, get along there. So there's three things I wanted to point out. Number one, the blood, the blood redeems us. It purchases us. We owe a debt to God, our sin. The Bible says the, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. We owe God a, 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 a debt. And, we, and nothing we can give him can pay that debt. And we, just, we don't have it. We don't have the currency. Jesus' blood paid for your sin, your debt. So now your debt is paid. Matter of fact, the last words on the cross that Jesus spoke, the last word he said was to telestai, which means the debt is paid. Not just that it is finished, but he said your debt is paid. That's, that's the effectiveness of the blood of Christ. So all of a sudden, God used the only currency, by the way, life is in the blood. The only currency to purchase or redeem you is the blood of Christ. That's the currency that he used to buy us to him, to cause us to be his. Uh, and, and I gave a few verses here. Um, Ephesians 1, 7, in him whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Why do we have this blood available to us? Is it because of something I did? Because I'm so cool? You know why? Because Jesus had showed grace to us, undeserved favor. None of us deserve it. And yet that's exactly what God did for us. So you don't have to become worthy in order to become a believer. If you're waiting to get yourself right before you can come to Jesus, that's not the, that's, that's, you're out of order. Jesus said grace is accepting you right where you are and purchasing you right there. You know, Chris and I, we go fishing every once in a while. I've never seen Chris pull out a fillet of fish out of the water. I've seen him pull out larger fish than me, but I've seen Chris almost accidentally go into the water. <laughs> but you know what? You never, you, never, you never pull out a clean fish. You know why? Because, because you pull out the messy fish. That's where you start. And then you take that fish and you prepare it and you make it so, so you can use it. Guys, we start in a place where we're messy, God accepts you in your messiness and he changes you. That's, that's the power of the blood. It starts right where you are. Every Billy Graham crusade, if you ever heard or watched the Billy Graham crusade, what was the song that was playing at the Billy Graham crusade? It's just as I am. Which means what? Right here, right now, this is who I am. Jesus saved me. That's the power of the blood. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to get good enough to get God. God takes you where you are. If you understand that, when Satan starts to remind you of your past, you can start reminding that idiot of his future. Because you have, it doesn't matter where you came from. It matters what Jesus did with you. He did for you. That's, I'm supposed to be having a study, not preaching, sorry. Uh, let's see. Hebrews 9, 12. Oh, this is awesome. He entered once the holy place, not by means of blood and goats and calves, which is, by the way, how they worshiped in the Old Testament. This is the blood that they used. But when Jesus entered, he entered by means of his own blood, securing an eternal redemption. Jesus came and he offered the blood that was a once for all sacrifice for sin. My sin is so big, you can't know, Pastor, all the things I've done, all the wickedness I've been involved with. Your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus because his blood is greater than your sinfulness, than your sin in your life. His blood is greater. One of my favorite old hymns, is uh, grace greater than our sin. A lot of people don't even know that. It's him. It's one of my favorites because it talks, the whole, th the whole hymn is about the wonder and the power of God's grace. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of lamb was spilt. I mean, that's powerful. That's grace. And that's what Jesus did to purchase you. So when the accuser says you're not worthy, you're not good enough, just remember the power of the blood. Jesus paid for you. Sight unseen. There are people right now that are buying houses in Payette, sight unseen. Good for them. <laughs> right? So Jesus bought you sight unseen. He paid for you. Well, he knew who you were, but you understand what I'm saying. He's willing to pay for you. Secondly, what else the blood does is it forgives us. John one twenty nine says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness of sin. I say it almost every time we have communion. If you ever wonder, why does pastor keep repeating the same verses over and over again? He needs to learn new Bible verses. You ever wonder that? 
The reason I repeat the same verses over and over again is because it's a mnemonic device that's actually helping you memorize Scripture. So I am teaching you Scripture every week. So you'll get sick of me saying it, but when you need that Scripture, it's going to pop up in your mind and you're going to know that's the Word of God. Because if I'm going to leave you anything, I don't want to leave you a you know, cute little joke or a little quip. I want to leave you with the power of, of the Word of God ingrained in you so much that you can't get away from it. So I'm preaching again. Just watch that. The blood forgives us. Guys, and the accuser tells you you're not good enough and that, that that sin has a hold on you, just recognize the power of Jesus has released you from the sin. You're no longer a slave to sin when you come to Jesus. You're set free. Now, does that mean we can choose to go back to sin? Yeah, you can choose who your master is. You can choose to have your master be righteousness and Jesus, or you can choose your master to be sin. Once you become a believer, you have a choice. By the way, before you're a believer, you don't have a choice. You're a slave to sin. There's all, you're going to do what's in you. You're going to sin. That's what the scripture says. Once you come to Jesus, you have a choice, and you can choose to go back to where you were, or you can choose to get closer to Jesus, but you're forgiven. Jesus forgave you. It's, it's, you have the opportunity to follow him. You have the opportunity. You're no longer who you were. Christ Jesus has made the difference in your life. So that's pretty cool. That's the power of the blood. The blood forgives you. Don't, don't let people tell you that you're still, that's who you were. Your sin is who you are. That's who you were. That's who Jesus saved you from. You're forgiven now. You're not the same person anymore. And lastly, the blood purifies us. Uh, in Revelation 7.14, we talked about this verse uh, earlier. Uh, these ones coming out of the great tribulation, they have washed their robes and they have made them white in the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, when you wash... I don't know if you've ever washed whites and reds before. The only time I did that was the only time I did laundry. So I haven't done it again. <laughs> Tanda says, you're not doing laundry anymore. What happens when you wash reds and whites together? You get pink. Everything I had was pink. It's not cool for guys to have pink underwear. So I'm just saying. Uh, so think about this. Jesus' blood washed these people and they're white. Why is that? Because the blood purifies us makes us holy. It's not, it doesn't intermingle, it doesn't stain us, it, it purifies us. Uh, John 1, 1 John 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. He purifies us. We're able to stand before God, which means not only am I forgiven, see the difference between being forgiven and purified is this, if I'm forgiven, then, I just, then I'm just like, wow, I, I've I, I, have, I, have, I have no past debt. Being purified, that means I presently can stand before the Lord and I'm, I'm pure. So like I'm no longer just forgiven, but I'm also pure. I can stand before God and he looks at me as his child, not as something that's stained with sin or just been washed, but I'm actually standing there and I'm justified. That's why the scripture says being justified freely by his grace because we've been purified by the blood of Christ. And that's, that's cool. So not only am I forgiven, but I'm also pure. I'm also holy. I'm also his. So that's where the sonship comes from because we're purified. That's the power of the blood. So not only am I forgiven, but I'm also worthy to stand in, in, before the Lord because I'm pure. So when people say, you're, you're not worthy to go before God, you're not worthy to do this, you should do this. You don't understand the power of blood is not only forgiven you, but it's purified you to do the work that God's called you to do. So you've got a purpose now going forward. Do you see the difference? It's not just forgiven for my past. I'm purified for now God's destiny and his purpose going forward. I stand before God. God doesn't look at me like, well, I guess you're the best I can do. You know, he looks at you as a son and daughter. That's somehow we look at ourselves, right? And God, you know, right, Ron? <clears throat> it occurred to me that that is the testimony. Is this is what I was, and this is what I am. Mm -hmm. and this is what I was, and this is what I am. That the devil wants to take away from you. Right. So he, he wants you to believe that that's who you are, right. not what you were. Mm -hmm. But it's that very testimony of the people that knew you and the people of your, your past is what brings salvation to people. It's, uh, Christ is there, but we're the proof that his salvation works. Right. And without that, there's that that's why they call it we're the testimony. We're, we're to bring the good news. Because we're the testimony. Right. We walk forward as the testimony to Christ's cleansing power. And, and that's why the church is so important. Absolutely. It's not just, not just who we were, it's who we are. Right. 
It's what God has done in us. And that's why we can stand going forward. Don't let the accuser tell you something any different. Remember what the blood of Christ did for you, how it changed you as you go forward. You just get that voice out of your head. Um, let's see. They also came, secondly, by the blood of the Lamb, and second thing was by the word of their testimony. Well, what does that mean? We talk about, okay, I understand the blood of Christ. What's this word of our testimony? What does that mean? Anybody got something to share about that? What's the word? Why is your testimony, why is your story, why does that help you overcome? Yeah, you're telling people that you're a different person than you were. And they can see it, by the way. Your testimony is... What you show. Yeah, it's the demonstration of who you are as a changed person. Like when people come back in your life, you're just totally different, Mike. It's the power of Christ. I mean, we can all go into combat with, with weapons of every sort. If you have no ammo, guess what? You are totally All right. So if we go before the enemy with our, with our testimony, the blood of the Lamb, which is our ammo, yeah. we use that for the authority of what happened in Mike's life. Right. You, you know, the devil can't take away that well that happened to me when I got saved. Yeah, people can see what, how, the difference that you are. The difference you are compared to what you were, compared to who you are now, they can see it because that's what the blood of Christ did. It changes you. The world wants to classify you as you were. Right. That's why they go back to destroy you. They go back in the past and pull things out. It happens in life. It happens in politics. It happens in everything you do. Right. That's a, that is a ingrained through the Satan just to go right. back and say, this is who you are, even though that happened 20 years ago. Yeah, but yeah. So we're, you know, we're almost naturally prone to that. Right. The world always does want it to define you by who you were, not who you are. Yeah. And they, 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 your friends want to do that too. Dave? Well, God will give us evidence of things that we don't see. Mm-hmm. Like in the first couple of verses in uh, Hebrews 11. Right. Yeah, that's what faith is, yeah. Right, right. So, he, so having the faith, it, it plays out to other people who who God created us to be. There's an evidence, as Hebrews 11 says. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So your your testimony, your story is really important. And I know people um, people don't recognize the spiritual growth that they've that they've developed as they follow the Lord. I was sharing this the other day with someone. Uh, came to my office and I was talking to him just to kind of encourage him. And they have a little, they have a little two-year-old. And I said, you know, I said, I said, do you have something where you're measuring how tall your two-year-old is? You know, do you, do you actually keep a track of that? And like, well, you know, someone does. Yeah, we, we actually have that. I said, well, think about it. Remember when they were like six, like 18 months? It's only been six months ago. How different were they six months ago? Well, they're a lot different, you know. And then go another six months. Well, how were they at a year? Remember the one-year-old birthday party where they're just sitting in the chair? They don't know whether to eat the fire on the candle or eat the cake, you know. Then you go six months beyond that, and they're just, in, they're just barely moving. You know what I'm saying? You, you, a lot of times we, when, you, when, you, when you can mark progress, you can notice it. But when you're with that child all the time, unless you think back, you don't really notice the progress. Like you forget. Like when you're with a little, little toddler all the time, you forget what they were like when they were just a year younger or six months, you kind of forget. Like it's, sometimes it's hard to remember what they look like as a baby until you see a picture. Then it, brings, then it all comes back because you don't notice the progress as you're living life. And I think sometimes what happens is as Christians, people ask us about our testimony. We, can't, we don't see the notches on the wall. So we haven't, we haven't taken inventory of our story to notice how we've grown. We just kind of, we just, unless someone brings us back and go, remember when you did this? Oh, yeah, I remember that. That was a long time ago. I would never do that today. You know, because you see the progress. You see the progress. Guys, you have grown spiritually. You have grown deeper in your relationship with God. But because you haven't recorded it, you don't see it. Your testimony, your story is a recording of where you've been and where you're going in, in your faith and your walk with Jesus. And I guarantee you guys have grown. I guarantee you, you're closer to Jesus today than you were. And if you're not, well, it's a good time to get back on the, get back on that horse and get the right spot. You know what I'm saying? 
Because you can be. Sometimes we don't feel like we're really growing when we are. You know, when you have a teenager, okay, you get, you get, a, you get, a, um, you get a teenager, a 13-year-old boy, you can see the growth in the summertime. I don't know if it's because out in your sun, they just get, spring up really big. I don't know what it is. But when they get, they, eventually they hit a physical limitation. I don't know if it's 16 or 17 or 18, whatever it is. But what you can't see is what's happening in their brain and all the neural pathways that are being developed as a young person. One of the things that really concerns me about all these shutdown of schools is we're limiting the development of these students in their minds because those, those pathways aren't being, being built. You're limiting them. You're actually, and, and those, those pathways that get burnt now, they last the rest of their lives. If they're missing them, they may or may not be able to build them to that extent later on in life. So you're actually missing, you're actually not building memories and places and ways to think and develop. You might be missing out on those things. And that's, you know, that's not good. You know, that's the kind of development that you can't see. Guys, sometimes God's developing you in ways that you don't see, but, it, but there's a depth that's being developed in you that will serve you for the rest of your life. Sometimes I think that's pain we go through, by the way. Sometimes pain develops us in ways that we can't see and understand, but those pathways that are developed serve us the rest of our lives. Nobody wants to ever, that's what I talked about last two weeks ago when I talked about pain. Nobody wants to go through pain, but the reality is sometimes that's the way we develop a depth with God. I, I've been on my knees more in pain than any other time in my life. That's the time I really connect with the Lord. And that's when I, that's when I found God to be as sure as I could ever hope him to be. So... That's the word of your testimony, guys. Your pain is your testimony. Your life is your testimony. Your growth, your character, everything about you shines Jesus because it's not you, it's him. And people around you, they'll notice the change. And if you don't attribute it to Jesus, they'll just think you read a good book. One of those self-help books, you know. I just read a good book, you know. Well, I read the good book. That's why I changed. Not a good book, I read the good book. If you don't acknowledge that Jesus is the one that changed you and that you're here because of him, you're missing out on your story that is powerful and can change people's lives. That's your testimony. I mean, you think about overcoming Satan. What overcame him? The blood of the lamb, word of the testimony. Your testimony is pretty, I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty nice company. Isn't it pretty nice company? The blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. So I think that'd be way down. And the scriptures goes on to say, who loved their lives uh, even unto death. Because they are willing, their, their testimony was of such caliber that even death didn't dissuade them in their service and love for Jesus. Now, I don't know if you'll ever be faced with the moment where you have to make that determination. Is it, is it this life? Do I have to give this up to serve Jesus? I don't know if we'll be put in that spot or not. But I think you might be surprised that your depth of faith, you're ready to make that sacrifice yourself. You might be surprised. Some of you go like, I'm willing to not find out, Pastor. Yeah. I don't need to find out. I'm good, you know. I remember one time I was, I was, I was at a, a gas station. I met a guy at the middle of the night. I don't know, it was like 10, 11 at night. guy called me. He said, Pastor, I needed help. And I went over to this gas station. And he's sitting there. And, and he was talking to me, asking me questions about my faith and stuff. And he said, and he, he reached in his pocket. And he said, I have a gun here. And I could take you out right now. And I'm like, it's okay. I'm okay. I, I know my Jesus, and Jesus is real. And my first thought that went through my mind was, Tana's going to kill me. <laughs> I didn't care if that guy killed me. I know Tana's going to kill me. You know? And I was, I was, I was actually kind of surprised at my reaction. I wasn't nervous. I wasn't scared. The guy didn't have a gun. I, I, I made it through that night, just in case you're wondering. Okay? But I'm just telling you that, that I wasn't, in that moment, I was there representing Jesus, and nothing else mattered. Nothing else mattered. So, guys, your testimony is powerful. Let me tell you something. You, you're having an impact, even now, with people around you that you can't, even, you can't even quantify the effect you're having on people around you. Because Jesus said we're salt and light. That means you preserve people. You have an impact on people. You, it light, you know, if there's no light in here, a little matchstick, everyone in this room will go right to it because you'll be able to see it. That's the power of light. That's what you are in people's lives. The darker it gets, the brighter you are. And that's the power that you have. That's, you change people's attitudes about who Jesus is. Sometimes for good and sometimes for bad. But you change your attitudes who Jesus is. 
I better pick it up. Okay, so uh, verse 12. Heaven is rejoicing, rejoicing, but the world is full of woe. Why do you think the last three and a half years are so difficult, according to that verse, verse 12? Why is it so bad? Why is the last three and a half years so bad? What does verse 12 say? Because Satan knows his time is short. He knows it's going to be an end, and he's going to make... And, and by the way, he can't, he can't go to God and complain anymore. So he's got nothing to do but focus on humanity. So heaven's all happy, but the rest of us aren't. So that's just the way it is. Um, okay, let's read verses 13 through 17. 13 through 17? Just, we'll at least read the last passage. You want to read that, Ron? Thank you. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given to the two... Was given the two wings of a great eagle, and so that he, she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from the, his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Okay, so the dragon again is Satan. The woman is Israel. Okay, so here we have the woman here in this last time, 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 and half a time which is three and a half years, which is the same as 1,280 days, which is all the same period. So, for the, so what happened is, now all of a sudden, we're, during this last part, Satan is actually trying to pursue this woman, who's Israel, and trying to destroy her. Which, by the way, if you look at Daniel's vision of the 70 weeks, at the abomination and desolation that happens, that the, the, everybody, everybody, basically there's, there's this peace, and then that happens, and then it's all out, we're going to get you, we're going to kill you. Satan has always had it in for Israel. This is nothing new. Always had it in for Israel. Um, I, you know, modern history, uh, you look at what happened in Germany in 1940, 1945, that area. Really, it's really 1943 to 1945. You look at the onslaught of, of evil that was pep- perpetrated against the Jewish nation. Why is that? Was that because of one man's evil? Uh, no, this is, this is because Satan was behind it all. Absolutely. Satan was behind it all. And Satan's always wanted to destroy God's people. He always wants to do it. Um, He still wants to do that. So here in this moment, you have Satan who's trying to, uh, and and the woman all of a sudden has wings. It's kind of interesting reading. I like to read a lot, study a lot about what people think these things entail. I read someone say, well, it's like a large military transport, and everyone's flying away, and they're just and I'm like, I don't know. It's an eagle, so it's an American transport, you know. We talked about the eagles. You know, the eagle represented every major government, like the Romans were eagles, the Germans were eagles, Americans were eagles, Venezuela's eagles, who knows? Could be them. I don't know if it's Venezuela. I can't remember all of them, though. But anyway, um, you just have this idea. I don't, I don't know what it is. I just think that what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, he talked about people running. And he said, boy, I hope it's not during the winter that this happens. You know, he's, <laughs> Jesus would know. But he was just talking about how that, this, that they'd be fleeing. So after this, after this moment, this, the middle year, the middle of the tribulation process happens, where all of a sudden now Israel's on the hit list. They're running, and, and as they're running, the, Satan's trying to destroy them. And what happens in this picture? Yeah, Satan spills out, spits out this river. Now, I, I don't know, again, we don't know what this picture represents. Some people I read said it's an army, uh, people just kind of flowing out trying to pursue them and kill them. Um, I was wondering if maybe it's a literal thing, like, so, like they just broke, blew up a dam and were trying to drown everybody. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. It could. Yeah, they could. Yeah, yeah. I mean, by the way, this doesn't mean that necessarily that everybody who's Jewish is in this case. It might be just those people who are believing Jewish in the last days. 
So I don't, I don't know which distinction that is, because I, I really don't know. But the scripture doesn't say. Um, but it is, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, Dale. I haven't. You know, talking about the hundred forty-four thousand. The hundred forty-four thousand. Yeah, so it, it, and really, the 144,000, I, I, I'm guessing that, that those would be encompassed in this number. They're trying to get away. Satan's trying to do what he can to destroy them. And then what's the defense to that destruction? Yeah, it's the miraculous, right? The earth swallowed up the water. So that's a miraculous event. That's, that's an undeniably miraculous event. It's an intervention by God to save his people. It's very, it's almost like... Um, a reverse of the uh, the Exodus event, where the water destroyed the enemy. Mm-hmm. Now the water is destroyed. The, the enemy's water is destroyed. So it's kind of like a backwards kind of Exodus. And by the way, the picture of the eagles uh, delivering Israel, that's actually a picture that's in Exodus. Exodus, let me see if I can find that. Um, it's Exodus... 19.4 says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings, and I brought you to myself. That's how the Lord described Israel's deliverance from the nation of Israel. He described it as eagle's wings. So it's almost like another Exodus event that happens as, the, as these remnant Israelis or these... Are, 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 and, and, and again, why do I think this is Israel, not the church? Okay, yeah, well, we believe the church got raptured, but one of the interesting things is that it talks about in the next verse, verse seventeen, it talks about the offspring of the woman. Well, who are the off? Who's the offspring of Israel? Christians are right. The Gentiles, Christians. If you read, you read, talk about the Gentiles, Christians that got grafted on to the olive tree. You know, or we're we're kind of brought into that fellowship. We're kind of brought into that life. To me, it makes, if you're saying that the woman is the church, by the way, and you think that's who it is, all the woman is, it just represents the church, well, then who's the church's offspring? If you, think it's, if you think that's all believers that are, if the woman represents all the believing people in the, in the last days, well, then who their offspring are? Are this their unbelieving kids, or I don't know who you think they are? I think, to me, it makes perfect sense to understand it as Israel, and then the offspring of Israel are, and even, by the way, verse 17 describes who these people are. In case you don't really know, it says the, verse 17 says, then the dragon was enraged, but the woman had went out to war against the rest of her, and went out to war, sorry, let me read this again. The dragon was enraged at the woman, and the dragon went out to wage war against the rest of her offspring, and this is who they are. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. So it describes you, so you, you don't have to wonder, well, who are these people? It tells you who they are. They have a testimony of who Jesus is, and they keep God's commands. They're believers. And so since Satan can't somehow, is prevented from finishing off Israel, he goes after the other people that are still around. He goes after who he can. Satan's an opportunist. He'll always go after who he can. You know, as a Christian, I think we need to be careful that we don't put ourselves in a position that make us easy pickings for the enemy you know you look at for instance in uh, in the scripture there are many times where spiritual people were in the wrong place like samson for instance uh samson was in a town and he ended up in a brothel that's the wrong place to be uh right so you look, look at the story of lot 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 pitched his tent towards sodom next time we see him he's actually living in the city and Bible, the Bible calls Lot a righteous man. We can't just say Lot was a, you know, he was a moron. You know, he's, he's a righteous person. But how did, he, how did he end up there? His family, by the way, was affected by that choice. He lost his wife. He lost his, the only thing he saved was his two daughters. And they were affected morally by his decision. So you can be a righteous person. You can lose everything by, making, by being in the wrong place. That's just, that, that can happen. It, it, it can happen. So don't put yourself in the place that's the wrong place as a Christian. You know, if you are, if your person has a weakness, um, some people have a weakness with alcohol, don't try to win people to Jesus in the bar. That's probably not your thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you just got to be careful where you go. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, 
I mean, you can think of a lot of things, you know. If you're a kleptomaniac, don't go into a jewelry store and try to witness people to Jesus. <laughs> Look at our samples. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Don't, don't put yourself in a spot where you can be tempted. So that's, um, so Satan's always looking for opportunities to pick you off. Uh, don't, give, don't give him that opportunity. Stay strong. So, all right. Any, any questions? I've got like five minutes left. I, I tried to, I did that last part really quick. So if you had any questions, because I went awful fast. I felt like I didn't, but I did. Yes, Kay. Yes, the eagle. <laughs> Back to the eagle. Um, would it possibly be that those are the three and a half years where there's peace and freedom and, you know, they have all this, they're like peace agreements that are coming and they're time to build their third temple so that could be a peaceful period. And then, you know, then it comes in and then, because the next three years, three and a half to that is pretty much trouble, right, 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 right. The last three and a half. There's, there seems to be, um, the, the, the 1280 days are talked about earlier in Revelation, chapter 12, and then we have the time, time, and half a time again, which is the second three and a half year. And the second three and a half years when that it's talked about the angels' wings taking and protecting them. By the way, both times, the, Israel's somewhat protected. But the second time, what's different about it is Satan is actively trying to destroy. Where Satan tried to destroy Israel the whole time, it's like during that season they're protected, they can't be destroyed. But it's now, after the, in the second three and a half years, he's actively trying to kill him. He's actively pursuing him and trying to wipe him out. He just can't. It's not because he doesn't want to. He just can't. God's, pre- God's preventing that from happening. And we don't know how, but he is. Katie? In reference to the last question you have on the, on the page. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. I think that his, um, his abilities are limited in some way. Um. Well, again, Satan, Satan is not all-powerful. He's not omniscient. He's, he's limited. He is limited by what he can do. So in other words, like God is omnipresent, which means God always gives you a gift, Christmas gift. No, that's not omnipresent. That means God is everywhere at the same time. But Satan isn't. Satan is limited. He's only can be, he can only, he's, he's, I don't know how corporeal he is, but he's not everywhere. So he, he already is limited to some degree. But it seemed like last three and a half years, he's doing, he's using, he's doing what he can do, but God always seems to limit what he can do at times. Like even with Job, God said you have free will, you have free reign, but you can only go this far because God put a cap on it. Now, even though Satan's here, um, he's trying to destroy Israel. God's stopping him from doing that, capping what he wants to do. So does that answer your question? So he, 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 Satan already is, number one, he already is limited. He's not unlimited. And he, and God still, even in the last days, is kind of capping what he wants to do. Because, but he's still doing a lot. The time when the last remnant of the people come to Christ is now. Yeah. They are going to see a stark, unveiled truth about Satan. Mm-hmm. Right, I, and I do think I do think if there's I went to a conference this last weekend, and, and one of the speakers says he really believes that God's going to give there's going to be one more one last outpouring of the Holy Spirit, giving people one last opportunity before the end comes to really make that choice. And and he goes and he said he, what's interesting he said I know the scripture says there's a great falling away that comes, but he goes how can there be a great falling away if there are people who are don't know Jesus? So maybe maybe there's a connection there. So I appreciate him saying that. I do believe I do believe that God's giving us an opportunity to know Jesus now, and it's a lot easier to do that now than it will be later. So, I mean, the Scripture says that now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. So, if you don't know Jesus, make know Him now, invite Him in your life now, because now is the best time to know Him. So, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to study Your Word together. Just pray that You'd help these words of life to to really seep down seep down into our hearts to change who we are. Father God, we look at the power of the blood today that it redeems us, it purchased us. Father, we're not, we're not our own anymore. We belong to you. Lord, you've saved us. Lord, you've forgiven us. Lord, you've purified us. We can stand before you as sons and daughters, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but Lord, by your mercy, because you saved us. 
So God, help us to remember that. Help us to remember our story, our, our testimony has value. And Lord, sometimes it has value that we can't understand or see. But Lord, the stories that, that of your deliverance, of your grace in our lives are powerful. God, I pray you'd, we'd have the courage to share them with people and to just attest that, that the reason I am who I am is because of Jesus. Not because of me, but because of him. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand that. Help us to recognize, Lord, that you're in control. No matter what happens in our life, we are not lo- want to look at this in our perspective. Jesus, we want to see your perspective throughout all these things we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yes. Absolutely. Hold fast to their testimonies. Don't lose, don't lose that testimony. Very good, Linda. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time tonight. God bless you. Yes.